Well, so what does an I squared C real time clock do? There are two basic requirements for an I squared C real time clock, which are one, to provide an accurate time, and two, to be able to read and write the time and configuration data on the device through a serial communications protocol. In this case, we are going to be dealing with an I squared C real time clock, so we'll be talking an I squared C. These devices are typically used in applications like system management, which performs housekeeping functions for large and complex systems, like motherboards, television sets, set-top boxes, and so on. They're also used in, in computers and BIOS clocks, which ensure that the computer times are always accurate, even when the computer is turned off. Shown below is a pinout for an existing I2C real-time clock integrated circuit. If you look at the pins, you can see that you have oscillator input and outputs for connecting to an external crystal. There are also serial data and serial clock lines that connect to the I2C serial communications bus of your system. Uh, there are also other features that are shown in, in this pinout, like an interrupt pin, which is typically used for indicating alarms when you reach a certain time, and also a digital clock out pin as well. If we take a look inside the I2C real time clock calendar, the block diagram would look something like this. It consists of three parts. If you look to the right of the block diagram, you see the RAM, which are all the data that you can read from the device over the I2C lines. And we'll discuss all these registers in more detail in the next slide. So we'll kind of cover the other blocks right now. Uh, the block highlighted right now, they determine when the time data is updated. This section consists of the oscillator, which typically drives an external crystal and scales it to a nominal frequency of about 1 hertz, depending on, on the RAM structure. And it's this frequency which determines the smallest time data value. In this case, if you look at the RAM, the RAM you see that the smallest data value here is seconds. So that 1 hertz clock determines when that's updated. This next section that's highlighted is the I2C bus interface. And it's this interface that interprets the I2C write and read commands that it receives from the master I2C device on the bus. And it's what accesses and points to the specific address of RAM and pulls that data out and sends it in. So the bus interface addresses the particular register, which is shown on the right, and that allows the data to be accessed. So it's actually a very simple device that we can model in our PIC microcontroller. Uh, this next slide shows a real-time clock register map from an existing I2C real-time clock. Uh, the registers highlighted right now are the control and status registers. And these are in addresses 0 and 1. These registers determine the operational modes of the real-time clock calendar and also controls other functions uh, like the alarm and has status indicators for interrupts. The next set of registers that are highlighted contain the time and alarm values. And these are the typical things you'd expect from a real-time clock. These are things like seconds, minutes, hours, days, etc. And these are typically uh, binary coded decimal formatted. So next we'll discuss how you actually talk to these I2C devices, in particular this real-time clock. Uh, this first message th format that we're going to discuss is a write transmission to the slave device. So if we look at the, the little diagram in below, um, we see that the first thing that's sent out over the I squared C bus is a start condition, which is generated by the master device. And that's shown by that S, that yellow S. Uh, the next, a control byte is clocked out on the bus, which consists of a 7-bit slave address and the read not write bit cleared, since this is a write condition. If the slave address and the control byte matches, the slave device of our real-time clock, the real-time clock will acknowledge the master device on the bus, which we see with that A over there. Following the acknowledge, the master device then clocks out the word address that it intends to write. The word address points to one of the registers in the register map that we saw on the previous slide. Once the slave device receives the word address, it responds with an acknowledge. The master device can then send data to be written to the word address that was written in the previous byte. So each data reception is acknowledged by the slave device. In addition, after each acknowledge, the word address internal to the, the I2C slave device is incremented to the next address. 
so that if an additional data byte is sent by the master, it'll also be written to the next address. So the master device can actually write another byte of data after each knowledge continuously. Uh, the way it ends the transmission is by sending a stop condition. So this is how you go about writing to those specific addresses that we showed in, in, the, previous, uh, in the previous block diagram. Next, we'll talk about how you go about reading from these, these registers. The next message format is a combination read. It is called a combination read because it combines a read command with a write command. The reason for this is that a typical read does not specify the word address to be read. The way to specify what address to read is to first write a word address, which initializes the word address pointer internal to the I squared C slave device, and then perform the read. So if we look at the I squared C transmissions in this slide, we see that we begin with a start condition, which is sent by the master, and then we have a control byte uh, with the uh, read not write bit cleared, which indicates a write. And then following that, we receive an acknowledge from the slave device, followed by the word address that we intend to write, which is uh, also acknowledged by the slave device. So if we look at, ju look at these, these, just these four blocks, they look a lot like the message that we saw on the previous slide, the write. So what's happened so far in this message is that, the word address, is that the word address pointer of the slave device has now been initialized. So after this is initialized, the restart condition is then sent out over the bus, and a control byte with the read not write bit set, in this case, indicating a read is sent out over the bus. The slave device acknowledges the matching slave address in the control byte and sends out the data at the word address location that was written in the first part of the message. So when the master acknowledges the reception of the data, the slave device needs to increment the word address, then send out the next data byte. But if the master no acknowledges the reception, as is the case here, no additional data is sent out, and the master terminates the transmission with a start condition. So these are the two basic ways you communicate to an I2C slave device. You can either write to it or read to it with a combination read.